Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Johnson Trayama Graduate School of Public Policy's first annual Robertson Lecture. And I'm the Canada Research Chair in Climate Change, Energy and Sustainability Policy, a professor with Johnson Shoyama Graduate School and a coordinating lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. I'm also honored to be your MC for tonight's Robertson Lecture. Established in 2007 by the University of Regina and the University of Saskatchewan, the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School, or JSGS, is a joint provincial school dedicated to educating graduate students, public servants, and those across sectors who are interested in advancing public value. With nationally accredited graduate programs and a wealth of executive education training opportunities, the school is widely recognized for its innovative professional training and research excellence. Speaking of research, we are fortunate that tonight's event is co-sponsored by the school's Center for the Study of Science and Innovation Policy, or CSIP. CSIP was created in 2014 with the support of Dr. Bev Robertson and strives to bridge the current disconnect between science and innovation, policy and governance by drawing together researchers, experts and stakeholders from scientific, social scientific and humanistic fields. Through events like the Robertson Lecture, we are able to bring together thought leaders, academics, public servants, students, and community members to listen and learn about current issues related to science and innovation policy in Canada. While tonight's event is taking place online, JSGS physical homes in Regina and Saskatoon are located on Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 land and the traditional homeland of the Métis. We pay our respect to our First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. We would also like to welcome those of you joining us from across Turtle Island. Our Canadian fellow speakers are from the unceded traditional territory of the Algonquin Nation. Our need for energy in Canada is growing as some energy options are becoming less desirable and not one option provides a solution. We are undoubtedly going to face many challenges ahead. We need an abundance of clean energy to help Canada meet its climate change commitments. In December 2020, the Government of Canada released a National Small Modular Reactor, or SMR, action plan to respond to the 53 recommendations identified in the country's SMR roadmap, launched in 2018. The action plan lays out the next steps for developing, demonstrating, and employing SMRs for public and private application. Although some may be hesitant when we talk about SMR's evidence over the past six decades has shown that nuclear energy is safe and clean. Not only can it help us get to net zero carbon output, but it can protect air quality and produce minimal waste. For those of you unfamiliar with SMRs, they are smaller than conventional reactors, allowing for less on-site construction, and they also have increased containment efficiency and enhanced safety. With so much information out there, I am looking forward to hearing from our experts tonight to clear the air and provide some guidance around whether small nuclear is the way to go for Saskatchewan. So before I turn it over to Dr. Jim Farney, JSGS Director of our University of Regina campus to bring a few remarks, I would just like to take care of a few housekeeping items. We kindly ask all attendees to stay muted and turn off their video during the presentation portion of our event feel free to turn your videos back on for the Q&As. The format for tonight's event is as follows. Following the opening remarks, our keynote presenter, Dr. Robert Walker, will present for approximately 20 minutes. And following his presentation, Ms. Deanne Cameron and Dr. Shannon Bragg Sitton will each present for about 10 minutes, following by a Q&A discussion amongst us four and a few questions from the audience. If you would like to ask a question, please use Zoom's chat function to submit your question directly to me, Marco Hurlbert. Because we have a large audience in a short amount of time, I would encourage you to keep your questions concise and to the point so our speakers can respond to as many questions as possible. If you have any logistical issue during tonight's presentation, please don't hesitate to send a message to Karen Jaster LaForge via Zoom's chat function. Now I would like to welcome Dr. Jim Farney to provide a few welcome remarks. Thanks, Margo, and, and thanks to everyone for coming tonight. Uh, I'm excited both by the panel 
and because this is the first annual Robertson Lecture. So, so kind of by way of, of celebrating that, I want to say a little bit about the lecture title and, and the goal of the series and some of the other work that's gone on around it. Um, the goal of, of the Robertson Lecture Series is to bring together not just people with scientific expertise, but, but thought leaders and, and folks in government, academics, students, community members, to, to allow us to talk about science and innovation in, in Canada in, in ways that, that cross those silos. And I think tonight's topic and, and the, the panel we've got is a great example of that. I don't think this is an audience where I'll, I would need to defend the, the, the idea that such discussions are crucial. Uh, but maybe one thing I, I, I could share is that this is the, the product of a very generous donation from the late Dr. Bev Robertson and his family. Uh, and he himself, I think, exemplified this quite well. He was, uh, Dr. Robertson was recruited to the University of Regina's physics department in 1969 to work on automated x-ray diffractometer. <clears throat> you can tell that I'm a political scientist, which I'm told is Greek for a person bad, both at science and politics, um, and was involved in the development of crystallographic software before retiring in 1997. He later became a professor emeritus. Uh, and this, this was a, a remarkably good academic career but he was, he was an institution builder as well. He was deeply involved in the development of the University of Regina as an autonomous institution separate from the University of Saskatchewan and standing on its own. Uh, his tireless work in diplomacy was essential to, to the development of the Saskatchewan Science Center in the city, which is a, a, a significant uh, thing if you're in the under 12 category. And in addition to his academic career, he, he was the owner and one of the kind of founders of the Bushwhacker Brew Company, uh, which was kind of the first real brew pub in, in Saskatchewan. Depending who you talk to in Regina, for those of you who aren't from here, any of those three institutions is, is equally important to the city. And I won't ask for a show of hands for folks from Regina, which is more important. Uh, the university people in the, in the audience might be humbled. In 2014, he gifted $500,000 to the Johnson Shama Graduate School to assist in the, in, in the development of the Center for Science and Innovation Policy uh, to establish a student fellowship. And I, I'm glad that we've got uh, a half dozen or so students supported by that fellowship with us tonight uh, and uh, in this lecture series. So that's uh, by kind of uh, way of saying how excited I am to, to kick, kick that series off with tonight's lecture. I'd like to welcome, he's, uh, I know Elaine and, and Scott Robertson are with us tonight, so welcome to them. Uh, and I know we've got a number of, of staff from Bushwhacker joining us as well, so um, it's nice to have you on my ground instead of going to your ground, as in better times I would. Uh, as Margot said, we've got a large audience from right across the country, which is exciting. Uh, so with that, so welcome. Uh, welcome to Regina virtually. Welcome to a wonderful conversation. And I'll turn it back over to Margo to, to lead us off on the evening. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. I'm now pleased to introduce our panel. Dr. Robert Walker. Dr. Walker has had a career spanning more than four decades as government scientist manager, executive, and science advisor. He's worked within Canada's nuclear energy sector, including as president and CEO of Atomic Energy of Canada Limited from 2011 until his retirement in 2015. He's a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Engineering and is a recipient of three honorary degrees. He's currently an independent advisor to public and private sector organizations, particularly on science and technology matters, and is a member of multiple boards in the academic and not-for-profit space. He is a senior fellow at the University of Ottawa's Institute for Science, Society, and Policy, with a particular interest in the role of science in decision-making. How apropos. Our next uh, uh, speaker, is uh, Dr. Or Deanne Cameron, and she's director of the Nuclear Energy Division with the Federal Government of Canada. In this role, Deanne heads up the team responsible for leading and convening Canadian public policy on nuclear energy. 
She joined the Government of Canada in 2007 to work on energy, environment, and climate change issues. This followed on 10 years of private sector experience, also working on energy and climate change issues, and a master's in technology policy from MIT, where she was named the Alfred Keel Fellow for Wiser Uses of Science and Technology. Deanne lives in Ottawa with her three children and a dog. I think we are in for an engaging evening. Our third speaker is Dr. Shannon Bragg Sitton, and she joins us from Idaho National Laboratory, which is the lead nuclear energy laboratory for the Department of Energy in the United States. Dr. Bragg Sitton is a pioneer in the innovative application of nuclear energy alongside other clean energy generators seeking to maximize energy utilization, energy affordability, and grid reliability and resilience through systems integration. Shannon currently serves as the co-director for the INL Laboratory Initiative on integrating energy systems that will leverage both nuclear and renewable energy sources to meet a range of electric and non-electric energy demands. She has also served as INL lead for the DOI Applied, that's Department of Energy, sorry, so many acronyms, Applied Energy Tri-Laboratory Consortium, which includes INL, the National Renewable Energy Lab, the National Energy Technology Lab. This consortium seeks to develop future energy systems that leverage all clean energy assets across all energy use sectors to dramatically reduce environmental emissions. Dr. Bragg Sitton holds a PhD and a master's in science in nuclear engineering from the University of Michigan, an MS in medical physics from the University of Texas at Houston, and a bachelor in science in nuclear engineering from Texas A&M University. Our speakers are going to provide us with examples of how small modular nuclear reactors could have a role in providing Saskatchewan with reliable power. So Dr. Walker, I am pleased to turn the floor over to you for your presentation. Thank you, Margo. And maybe you can hear me, Margo, just uh, nod your head yes. there. Got yes. it. I just want to bring up my presentation here, folks. Uh, it, uh, a little bit of the engineer in me that we got to have a presentation to, to help with this. Everybody can see that? Yeah, got it. And you can all hear me okay. Got it. Yes. Okay, well, look, Margo, thanks enormously for the invitation I, I received from the university to uh, to speak today and, and to uh, Dr. Robertson's family. I'm, I'm truly honored here to be able to contribute to uh, today's celebration of, of Dr. Robertson's life and career. Uh, in our new normal virtual world, I come to you this evening from my basement office in my home in rural Ottawa. And just as uh, Margot indicated, I wish to acknowledge that uh, my home is situated on the Onseda territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. To kick off my remarks, I, I want to give three observations that uh, are going to frame uh, what I intend to cover here. Uh, first, there's generally a, a broad consensus today among policymakers and, and the public that greenhouse gas reductions need to uh, occur and, and, and dramatically so. The debate tends to now be focused on the how, how fast, who pays. Second, there's a, a similar broad consensus that variable renewables, wind, solar, must and will play a very big role in that transition of, of the energy systems ahead of us. The third element is that there is not yet a broad consensus on the role that nuclear energy can and should play in, in this transition. In this regard, uh, a number of you, you're online here, so undoubtedly have heard of this big idea of small nuclear and the important arrow in the quiver that it could play in the transition to net zero. So in my remarks today, I want to help advance our collective conversations, conversations on the, the why, the what, and how, the possible roles that nuclear in the ambition to get to net zero uh, emissions by 2050, whether in Saskatchewan, whether in Canada, whether in the world, that could possibly play. And of course, these remarks are going to include this specific idea of small nuclear expressed in the concept of small modular reactors. So let's start. And, and context matters. If I've learned anything in four decades, in government and science, it's context matters. And let's begin with something very close to home and that's the COVID pandemic. And 
it's my observation there's a number of lessons that uh, we're observing in the past year that I think will play out when we look at the uh, transition to net zero has for us. The place to start is that the recognition that we are not all in this together. The impacts uh, of the pandemic, whether on the, from the disease or the consequences of the disease on the economy, are not playing out the same for everybody. And that's going to be the case as we transition to net zero. Secondly, it's the issue of science. Do we believe it? And importantly, do we believe the agent communicating the science? And do we accept the way governments are interpreting and applying that science? The third comment is there's a whole bunch of new normals here. And it's been quite amazing to the extent to which and the speed with which uh, uh, our, our communities have adapted to that new normal. What survives post pandemic, we'll see. But the point here is that a transition to net zero is going to have new normals. Fourth is that technology both uh, contributed to getting us in the mess and is a big contributor to getting us out. Arguably, it's the extent to which communicated, communications have made the world smaller and allowing us to travel uh, easily uh, to every corner of the world has helped uh, spread the, the, uh, the virus. But on the other hand, this amazing development of vaccines, which brings me to the last point and quite germane to my remarks here, which is the concept of vaccine hesitancy, where people, uh, are looking at the risk benefit of vaccines for the, them individually, their families and collectively, and just trying to understand where, where their thinking sits of that risk benefit balance. My second comment is about the transition. And while we talk about an energy system transition, the reality is the, uh, the uh, uh, transition to net zero is actually gonna be transitions within transitions. I'd first remark that there's actually a very strong uh, dependency here in Canada on the journey to reconciliation and the way that will play out in, in parallel with the transition. The second is it is about energy and clearly that has a number of big implications for those uh, that work in the energy sector with uh, perhaps uh, dramatic changes in, in your work relationship, your community relationship, it will be different. That then leads to my final comment, which is the societal transitions, the new normals that will emerge and perhaps the area that is of least certainty as we look at moving forward. My next comment is about energy system transition. The first and key point here is that there is no silver bullet. Yes, we need more variable renewables, but uh, the serious analysis of what's needed suggests that that will not be enough. And in that, I'd like to suggest that the concept of small nuclear could actually be what I like to call an energy system multi-tool, which can contribute in a variety of innovative ways. And finally, is the importance in this journey of conversations. I think we'd all uh, uh, observe and perhaps uh, grind our teeth at the degree which, which every big issue seems these days to be politicized, a victim of partnership and, and polarization. Uh, augmented by the echo chambers of social media. We need new ways of, of rediscovering the way we used to communicate respectfully and thoughtfully. I believe media has a big play to this. We need journalism, not journalism that simply reacts to the newsworthiness of a, of a you know, conflict between people, but actually digs deeper to help us understand. And I'd highlight the importance of events such as today where universities bring together people to help us explore, particularly with the next generation of leaders, our, our you know, youth going through universities, of what all this could mean. And finally, uh, it's my personal view that we have lots to learn from our Indigenous peoples on what meaningful, uh, respectful conversations and engagement is all about. So let's let's begin with a look at some realities today. And uh, uh, a theme I'd like you to walk away with is this notion that Canada is among a, a small handful of countries around the world that is a tier one nuclear nation. From uranium mining to uh, nuclear power to uh, a, a, a world-class regulator to a, a domestic reactor design to uh, a substantial investments in research and de development, we have it all. I wanna just take a, take a pause and talk about Saskatchewan and uranium mining. Uh, and the, the reality is that your uranium, a partnership between Saskatchewan citizens and our Indigenous people of North, Northern Saskatchewan, is a significant, significant enabler powering the global nuclear fleet 
you as a result have contributed enormously to reductions in greenhouse gas. And on behalf of my wife and my nine grandchildren, I wanna to say to you, thank you. We also, when you look at those pictures of Bruce Power, the uh, Darlington site, the, uh, the Pickering site, uh, what's your first reaction when you look at that? And surely it must be big. Nuclear is big. These reactors are big. Now it doesn't have that particular large in, uh, land space when you talk about the, what's being produced. The Bruce Power Station is the largest nuclear generation station in the world eight operating reactors, but those reactors are big. They're close to a billion watts of electricity come out of each of those reactors, and they're operating for close to 95% of the time. Big, stable power. You know something? They also cost a lot of money. To build a new reactor today of this class would run you somewhere five, seven billion dollars per reactor. But when you look at the ability to turn that in while it's suitable for Ontario, it's not necessarily a good fit to a province with a grid the size of, of uh, Saskatchewan. All to say, though, is that we have a very, very capable supply chain, operators, uh, the mining sector, we know this business. So the backbone to allow that to expand and grow into Saskatchewan beyond what is already there is certainly a, a strong possibility. But when we look at, let's look at just a, a briefly of where nuclear is in, in the world today, N nuclear fission I'm talking about here. So there's about 400 reactors around the world, 30 countries. It's about 10% of the global electricity generation capacity. You can see the number 400. GWE is gigawatt electric. So that's billions of watts electric. And you can see about 400 reactors, 400 gigawatts. So each reactor is about a billion watts electric. Uh, you know, we have 19 reactors in Canada. I've just given you a picture of them. Uh, and that's a big thing for two provinces, Ontario and New Brunswick. In Ontario, it's a, it's a heavy lifter. It doesn't, it generates about 60% of the electricity used by the province. Uh, nuclear is growing. It's, there's 50 reactors in construction currently around the world. I said, they're primarily uh, not in uh, North America or Europe, they're in Asia. Uh, they're largely on budget and on schedule. Uh, if I were to ask you before this presentation, what is the single largest clean energy project in North America? I'd ask how many of you would have come up with the refurbishment of 10 reactors in the Ontario's Candu fleet. That is the case that is going forward. It's been going running up for four years. It's $25 billion over 15 years. And that will refurbish 10 reactors and it will stand, extend the life of those uh, units for another 30 years. Uh, and you know something, they could potentially be refurbished again. It, and uh, the first the reactor has been completed on schedule and on budget. When you look at the data, uh, I, you know, I'm a data guy, I guess I look at data. What you find is that it tells you that nuclear energy is among the lowest in terms of carbon emissions, it's among the most affordable, affordable, most scalable, and among the most safest, uh, pardon me, among the safest. That's one side of the story, but you know something, there's another. And, and that's the case that a number of uh, hi uh, historic uh, nations with nuclear energy have decided to exit. We're seeing plants in the US fleet, the largest fleet in the world, about 100 plants that are being shut down prematurely before the end of their life. And that's because they can no longer compete with lower cost natural gas, not because of uh, renewables, because of natural gas. We have over the past few years started the new building of uh, first of a kind, the next generation of, of, of big reactors, what you call generation three. Third generation reactors differ because they have what's called passive safety. So if you lose the electricity driving the pumps, for example, to circulate water, the reactor will go to zero power on itself. Those are big, they're first of kind, they're all over a billion, uh, a billion watts electric. Um, and they are generally, most of them are over budget and under and behind schedule, largely attributed to the fact that these are the first times in, in some 30 years you've been building something new and you don't have the mature supply chain to do it. We have the three big accidents that have occurred in the last 40 years that drive the public perception of risk. And so, you know, we talk about uh, vaccine hesitancy. What I, 
I talk about here is this notion of uh, high levels of persistent nuclear energy hesitancy in the public. Let's explore what that's about a bit. And, and this is gonna be a, a bit um, of my attempt to talk about some of the elephants in the room when people talk about uh, nuclear energy today. And what I'm gonna do is just show you uh, one of the elephants and a bit of how uh, the industry, the regulator uh, address that problem. I'm only gonna present it and not go into detail. We could have a discussion that occupies uh, a whole week on the merits of each of these points. But at the end of there is a point I'm gonna make here. So first about ionizing radiation, nuclear power plants release harmful radi radiation. The regulatory basis for this industry is that um, ionizing radiation is part of the background. It's there all the time. Uh, and there is this, this observation from science that there's a threshold below which we can't measure an effect on things living. And what we typically do is set the, the uh, threshold for radiation releases from nuclear plants two orders of magnitude lower, and the actual uh, industry achieves three orders of magnitude lower. So that's one perspective. The second is the issue of accidents. There's been severe accidents. They'll occur again. Uh, actually, when you look at how many people have actually died from uh, radiation, either uh, radiation poisoning or cancer-induced radi um, radi radiation-induced cancers. It's a small number. Uh, the bottom line is if you look at the life cycle of these technologies, uh, of the all these technologies, whether it's uh, fossil fuels or other low-carbon, nuclear actually turns out to be the safest of, electric, of, of those technologies. The third is about waste, dangerous, no proven solution. The solution that uh, the nuclear engineers and the uh, uh, regulators have uh, long held is the answer here is by uh, deep geological repository. I would highlight this is not your local landfill. The idea here is to essentially mimic what uh, um, nature does when it puts uh, minerals in deep um, uh, structures in the geology that are stable for millennia and that, 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 that have natural barriers that separate those minerals from the biosphere and have clearly done it because those minerals aren't in the biosphere. Actually, you have a natural GGR in Saskatchewan and it's the, um, it's the uranium deposits that, it, that uh, are in Northern Saskatchewan. I'm talking about the mines, I'm talking about that uranium that's deep in the ground in these stable uh, structures has been there for millennia. And guess what? You're not seeing uranium in groundwater. You're not seeing it in the biosphere because there's a natural DGR there that's working. Uh, you know, there's other points that I'd highlight it there. And finally, this issue about costing to build. These are expensive to build. They take a long time to build. As I pointed out, you want to build a, a reactor at a gigawatt electric, you're, you're talking somewhere around $7 billion, and it can take you up to a decade to build it. But when you tie that together with the fact that these, uh, these uh, reactors last a very long time, they're relatively inexpensive to operate, the fuel's very, very inexpensive, and they operate at what's called high capacity factors, how long are they on typically, 90% of the time plus, that the economics actually work. So when you look at all of this, my point is that every statement on that chart, the red and the black, are true or likely true. You have to then come back to say, well, now who do I trust? Mm, I'm not so sure about I trusting their why should I take any of those risks? Are there alternatives? And we're not into a debate on the facts of the story. We're in the debate of, well, hold it now. Do I accept the risk or not? Can we do it another way? And this is a, a very important discussion. I think this is part of the challenge we have with nuclear energy because so often our dialogue is focused on the risks. But let's talk a bit about the benefits. And the, the place to start is where we have come over the past uh, six decades where this industry has grown up. Why do we all commit to nuclear energy in the first time? You know, it's actually traced back to the first oil embargo coming out of OPEC and nations feeling that they needed to secure their electricity grids to uh, and have a reliable source that wasn't dependent on somebody else. 
cost to ratepayers. In Ontario, nuclear energy is just behind hydro as the cheapest electricity source for Ontarians. And oh, by the way, it's very low GHG emissions. In fact, nuclear power, if you look at the entire life cycle from mining through to um, through to a generation to disposal, it's it's about comparable to wind and it's lower carbon footprint than, uh, than uh, um, hydro and solar. And finally, a point that rarely gets mentioned is air pollution. We, you know, in the 60 years that we've been using uh, um, nuclear power, we haven't been burning fossil fuels. And that means we have removed, removed air pollution. Uh, the World Health Organization estimate, estimates that we have about 300, uh, 3 million premature deaths annually globally due to air pollution. And so if you go back into the math and there's been analysis of this done, that in fact, nuclear power has, has actually uh, reduced, has eliminated premature deaths in millions of people and actually saved our global uh, uh, healthcare system trillions of dollars in the time it's been around. An interesting perspective. So what's coming forward? This is Bob's four by four. You know, I, I own a pickup truck, love it. But there's the four points that talk about where we are today, but what's coming. And this is about, yes, we need more of that conventional nuclear power, but what about new nuclear power? And I'd say four principles. First is this idea of, of dispatchability. In other words, current uh, nuclear plants are focused on big base load. You want to turn them on, you want to operate them. But with these new ideas, you can actually make that electric energy dispatchable. You can use it and turn it on when you need it. And the key point here is that this is a, an enormously important lever, the multi-tool multi -tool to allowing deeper penetration of variable renewables into our grids. The second is this idea of fit for smaller grids, such as here in Saskatchewan. You don't need a single plant at a billion uh, watts at you know, $7 billion. You need something smaller. The third point here is that uh, the transition to net zero is about far more than electricity. Nuclear generates heat. Heat enables so many other opportunities for uh, carbon reduction. And finally, we have our remote communities that are in many cases off the grid and don't have any, are in a situation of energy poverty and put a very small reactor, something around a megawatt, five megawatt electric into that, uh, into that uh, community and you've got a game changer in terms of its energy security. So who's saying that? I mean, that's, you probably say, well, that's what the industry is saying, nuclear industry is saying, of course it looks good. But if we look at where uh, the th thought leaders around the climate change agenda are thinking, we, we just go from just a little over five years ago when we had the Paris Climate Agreement, it, it, its big mantra was variable renewals will lead the way. Yes, and that's still the case. However, there was no mention, little mention of nuclear energy. 2018 roll forward and we had the group of ministers coming together post 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 Paris looking at the opportunities countries that were in that were you know tier one nuclear nations and the opportunity particularly to, to connect nuclear with renewables and I kind of already hinted at that 2018 we had a key report from that uh, very influential intergovernmental panel on climate change Margo you've mentioned this and it looked at a variety of scenarios that could get us to a net zero and came to the conclusion, we yes, we need lots more variable renewables, but we also need more nuclear energy. And about half of those scenarios said, you gotta, you gotta get up at least 60% over where you are today. And finally, we have the very uh, in influential International Agent Energy Agency, which provides annual updates to where we're going in the energy mix moving forward. In 2019, it did an exhaustive look at where nuclear needs to play in this. And the bottom line is it needs to play. If we try to get to net zero without more nuclear energy, the risk goes uh, very high and the costs go uh, much higher, again, postulating maybe a 30% increase over the footprint we have today. So, so how do you do that? And, and if I just come back and try to summarize it, there's three big takeaways here. First is we've got that current fleet, 440 reactors. We need to keep it operating as long as we can. And leading the way is Canada with the refurbishment of its can-do fleet, that kind of thing. The second is we've got those, uh, those generation three reactors. I talked about the 50 or so that are being built. We need to continue to build on that. Many of those uh, uh, supply chains are beyond the first of kind challenges and, and 
and rolling those out. And the third element is this notion of transitioning to what I've branded here, new nuclear energy. What's it got to do? Well, we know it's, it costs a lot and takes a, lot, a long time to build those reactors. We've got to go to simpler designs, safer designs. And the, the concept of safety, reactors are safe today. That is, the safety is often engineered in by ways of managing the hazards in the reactor. We want to go to safety designs that are built on physics. I'll give you an example. The, the backbone of reactors around the world are pressurized water reactors. They're pressurized. The vast majority of designs coming forward today for small modular re reactors operate at atmospheric pressure. So you immediately taken away a big hazard that you don't actually have to engineer a solution around. The third about this is about this idea of dispatchability and with that to enable the penetration of variable renewables that uh, people uh, want to see. This idea of looking beyond electricity markets. And finally, a number of these concepts uh, uh, actually uh, burn some of those long-lived uh, um, fission products and, and um, activated uh, nuclei that are the waste streams we want to see less of, so helping reduce those. That does not mean we don't eventually need a deep geological repository, but we may be able to uh, limit the amount of content going into it, the amount, amount of material. So let me just uh, say how to get there. Well, it's actually bringing together two big ideas. And obviously we talk about SMRs, but that's not the only side of it. It's also about uh, changing the, the physics and designs of the reactors themselves into, uh, you know, I talk about we're deploying third generation now, this is moving to fourth generation. And uh, I'm not gonna try to turn you all into reactor physicists here and get into that detail. Um, I would commend you to, there's um, uh, work that's gone on with Professor Hussain at University of Regina that's done a wonderful job of looking at the various uh, SMR concepts. But if you just read the words that are around this, you can see that all of these are about uh, making the future better through the combination of fourth generation and SMR concepts. And, and this is really happening. There is, is a, you know, last count, about 70 companies around the world that are on the verge of uh, saying, let's get it out and get the regulator looking at it, let's demonstrate it. An important point here though, um, is that if you look at the history of nuclear power going back over 60 years, particularly in the heyday from the 50s through the 80s, in large, large part in the big uh, national labs in the US, virtually every one of these uh, concepts that are now being proposed were prototyped. Uh, what you're seeing now is uh, uh, innovations in the engineering to bring those to market. So uh, what's the big idea here? I'm gonna give you two views of this, uh, just a couple more slides. But the, the first here, the value proposition of the SMR is not about the reactor. I've just uh, stolen a, the back end of a diagram here from one reactor concept by a Canadian company, Terrestrial Energy. What does it do coming out of that reactor is it produces high temperature salt. And that's the medium for storing, storing energy. And it's in this balance of plant where the magic happens. Because with that high temperature salt, you can do three things. The first is you can use that heat to turn a generator, to turn a turbine rather, and what do you get out of it? Electricity. The second thing is you can actually store that heat. And then when the wind isn't blowing or the, or the sun isn't shining, you can turn that heat back into electricity and you've got that dispatchable power. And the third piece is you can uh, take the fact that what reactors produce is heat. And actually heat is the thing that uh, we need a lot of to do, deal with the uh, greening of industrial processes and whatnot that you don't get from just electricity. The magic here is that when you look at that balance of plant, the concepts of SMRs are actually multiple. This is not one reactor design. The reactor designs coming forward tend to be tailored for these three markets driven by kind of three uh, sizes. One is on, on grid power. And we talk about reactors that are, you know, about, about a quarter, a third the size of the Canada reactors that we have in Ontario and New Brunswick. Um, and, and what do you get for that? 
I would also point out that by and large, these designs don't anymore require water. So you can replace them. You can replace the fossil fuel plant uh, one for one. You can look for, therefore, get growth in electrification. This notion of dispatchable energy solution that enables variable renewables to, uh, for deeper penetration in our grids. The second is the combination of of heat and electricity to contribute to either either its mines, uh, helping with oil extraction in the in the oil sands, or a variety of heavy industries. And this also segue into a new economy for transportation based on synthetic fuels or the hydrogen economy for heating. Uh, and the thought final piece is very small reactors that play into the um, into remote community space and whether that's electricity distribution heating water purification, food production, or frankly, all of them at the same time, you have a lot of magic that could happen. So let's see how this might work for Saskatchewan. So again, I'm, so we've got an SMR and let's assume that it's playing in this space of off of ba of balance of planet, what it could do. Uh, Saskatchewan, if I got the numbers right, has about a, a, a gigawatt electric, electric these days from coal. And I understand that there's thinking about, well, between now and 2030, we could migrate that coal to natural gas. Natural gas is a very, very flexible um, uh, uh, source of energy for both baseload and for dispatchable power. You can ramp it up and put it online very, very quickly. A very, very strategic advantage. And it's like about half the, uh, the carbon footprint of coal. So good thing to do. The second thing you do then is as we prove these uh, designs and proving is enormously important. There's a social license element to that. There's a regulatory element to it and an economic element. But what you could then do is look at migrating off gas where those SMRs again, contribute to base load and importantly also dispatchable powers. And with that, you get more opportunity to bring more uh, wind and solar into the mix. So there's the, uh, you know, that's a lot of thinking I know going on within uh, SAS power in that direction. I'd suggest to our, our folks in Saskatchewan, there's a third element. And that is by looking at that process heat space, uh, uh, um, space there and whether it's uh, looking at where uh, the province wants to go in its place in synthetic fuels and clean chemicals and hydrogen economy. And if you marry that up with some of these other goals, all the better. But you know something, what is this? This is jobs for uh, communities, uh, well-paying jobs in the long term. This is about being part of the clean energy transition, not having it happen to you. So I think there's a great opportunity to think in that space. The second view I want to give you is to recognize that a, an SMR system is not just about an SMR. Uh, and in fact, the economies of the SMR concept are built on the notion of fleets and the fact you uh, produce the modules that are these SMRs in factories and it's repeatedly doing it so you get the benefit of production learning and costs go down. So you need fleet. We're not gonna get a fleet in, on, in Saskatchewan. So the question is, where is the rest of the fleet? And that's one of the key reasons that we need a Canadian approach. I'd also highlight this notion of um, SMR module manufacturing in the smaller designs that would be for the off-grid and, uh, and uh, uh, resource extraction, typically below about 15 megawatt electric. These are typically referred to as nuclear batteries. So in fact, the whole module is a self-contained and fueled unit. It goes into a below ground structure for security. And then that operates for between 10 and 20 years. And the module then is extracted back to the factory for refueling or refurbishment or decommissioning and away you go. And then, so you tie into that your strategy for nuclear waste management with ultimately high level waste, the, the fuel that you can't use anymore going into the National Deep Geological Repository. And of course, there's a whole set of questions around the mining side. And the point is that you're, you know, Saskatchewan, you're here today. No question you're here today. The question is, do you want to be in some of these other places? 
I've indicated these arrows because they're, in my mind, they're enormously significant. There's a number of uh, situations here, you can see connecting these boxes where we're actually transporting nuclear materials. That doesn't mean it's highly radioactive, but nevertheless, it's nuclear materials. So in that notional SMR system, the question for Saskatchewan is not just about, do I have an SMR? It's what role you wanna play in that overall system. And the same question then rolls out to a Canadian footprint and potentially into an international footprint. For example, are we going to, where are we gonna be doing the fuel manufacturing? Is it gonna be done in Canada? Could it be done in the US? A number of interesting perspectives to have. And my final point here, and perhaps the greatest takeaway I would hope you would come away with this is that every one of the dots I've indicated on this uh, slide is an area that needs engagement because we need agreements. Agreements that this is acceptable, the right thing to do with our indigenous right ho rights holders, with our hosted and impacted communities. You think about just the siting, but also the transportation. Agreements for ownership, operation, and licensing of these reactors. I mean, this is operations of nuclear power plants is not in the uh, the current strengths in Saskatchewan here, but the question is how could that be done going forward? And finally, that's going to culminate in regulatory licenses. If I were to leave one message with you today, it's the importance of engagement early and deep and make sure we listen to what uh, those key folks, our Indigenous communities, potentially uh, siting uh, communities, think about all this. So to wrap this all up, what's happening in Canada, this place to the concept you've heard about first a roadmap and then an action plan. Why Canada? Three big things that, are, that make that case. The first, I've already uh, talked to the fact that we have the industry smarts to do it. The second is we have markets, the on-grid market, the, uh, the uh, you know, mining market, the Northern communities market. And we have a regulator that's got a um, science informed process that allows innovation to become in and the tires kick to make sure it can work. Uh, there's an action plan. I believe Deanna in a moment is gonna talk a bit more about it. My, my observation to you is engagement is ramping up, partnerships are taking place and demonstrations are moving forward with things that are gonna be happening in the coming uh, uh, few years that will Really let people see this and kick the tires. Those are my remarks and I'll turn it back over to you, Margo, and just stop my share there. Great. Thank you, Dr. Walk Walker, for a great balanced introduction for us in Western Canada to the issues. You identified some elephants, but I would argue that you also identified some mighty mice, some benefits and important actors that exist here in Canada. So I have some questions and I've received some great questions, but before we do this, we're going, I'm going to invite Deanne Cameron to offer a few remarks. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, actually, it could be good afternoon or good morning, depending on where everyone's joining from. Uh, I think, Margo, you were going to share a screen. If we could go to the first slide in the deck, that would be great. My name is Deanne Cameron. I'm the director of the Nuclear Energy Division. Uh, we're a couple slides in here. If we can just go up to the top of the deck, that would be great. Um, I'm the director of the Nuclear Energy Division within the federal government of Canada. Uh, in this role, it's my distinct privilege to oversee the team that leads and convenes national nuclear policy for Canada. Uh, now, I'll just take a moment to explain what I mean by that, uh, because in, with Canada being one of the most decentralized federations in the world, one of the key roles of the federal government is to convene a pan-Canadian or a Team Canada national approach. We share jurisdiction between the federal, provincial, and territorial governments in the area of energy policy, and that's true on nuclear energy policy as well. We have a special relationship with Indigenous peoples that we are aiming to reconcile. And along with several other countries, we've privatized many of the functions of the nuclear sector. Uh, not only the nuclear sector, but, but also the nuclear sector, which means that to achieve anything significant in the area of energy policy and projects, a lot of disparate decision makers from different orders of government, 
indigenous peoples and industry must buy into a common vision and be rowing in the same direction. And I'll touch on this again later when we talk about Canada's SMR action plan. Um, I'd like to, to just take a moment to acknowledge that I'm joining you from my home in Ottawa, Ontario on the unceded territory of the Algonquin people. And I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation to join this distinguished panel event. Uh, turning to the outline slide, that's the next slide. I'll be structuring my talk in three parts tonight. First, I'd like to provide a little bit of context on Canada's climate change policies, then turn to nuclear in Canada and finally small modular reactors and what's new and what's coming down the pipe. Uh, next slide, please. So starting with a little context. In 2020, the Government of Canada released its Strengthened Climate Plan, building on the 2016 Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change and our original 2015 commitments under the Paris Agreement. The Strengthened Climate Plan is investing $15 billion in clean energy investments, putting a price on carbon pollution that will be rising to $170 per ton of carbon dioxide by 2030, and is supported by a strong policy framework that includes a number of uh, pillars and a number of elements. One of those pillars or elements is a clean fuel standard. Another is a hydrogen strategy for Canada. And our SMR action plan is another element of our strengthened climate plan. Turning to the next slide, to put this in a global context, I'd like to share some information with you about a key report by the International Energy Agency, that's the IEA. Now the IEA is the leading international organization, uh, you know, where governments uh, from around the world collaborate and look to the organization and the specialists in the organization to provide energy analysis that informs energy policy. It's a key source of analysis evidence, modeling, and forecasting on clean energy and climate change. In 2019, the IEA published its first report on nuclear energy in over 20 years. And this is very significant because prior to that, many international discussions about meeting our climate change objectives and how to, how to reach, how to, how to succeed in reaching that two degree scenario that we set out as, as an international community or even more ambitiously, the 1.5 degree scenario. Um, much of the international discussion in, you know, until that 2019 report by the IEA was silent on the role of nuclear. Um, and what the IEA did in 2019 when it published its report is it surfaced to the highest level uh, of policy discussion and public facing discussion, um, a, very, uh, a very rigorous uh, evidence basis and had sort of groundbreaking and ground moving findings. There are two findings in particular I, I would wanna highlight for you. The first is that the global, uh, the global risk of outright failure to meet our climate change objectives is significantly higher if we attempt to meet our targets without nuclear than if we do so with nuclear. And even if we do succeed, it would cost the world 1.6 trillion US dollars more if we try to do it without nuclear than if we do it with nuclear in the mix. To put that in perspective, that's roughly the size of the entire Canadian economy. This was ground moving because this was not the International Atomic Energy Agency. This was not the Nuclear Energy Agency. This was the International Energy Agency that had previously really been silent on nuclear, but sort of reached that point in 2018, 2019, where they realized they had to take a really hard look at what the real options are for the world to get to two degrees from where we are to two today. Next slide, please. Now a little context about nuclear energy and nuclear in Canada. Uh, the takeaway here is Canada is really good at nuclear. And, and many people in Canada, many Canadian citizens don't know this. It's sort of been the silent workhorse in the background for a long time. Um, but let me just call it out. We, are, we were the second country in the world uh, to generate nuclear energy, to have the know-how to do that at Chalk River Laboratories in Ontario. We were the first country in the world to declare that we would use nuclear only for peaceful purposes. 
roughly a quarter of Canada's Nobel Prizes are related to nuclear science. And as Bob mentioned, we're one of a small elite group of countries, only about eight countries out of over 200 countries in the world. There's only about eight of us with the type of capabilities that we have in nuclear in Canada. Canada is the second largest producer of uranium to the world. And from our nuclear power plants in Canada, we provide half of the world's supply of a radioisotope called cobalt-60, which is key in cancer treatment. And it's also been key in the pandemic response. Cobalt-60 from Canadian reactors is, has been used to sterilize once through medical equipment uh, like PPE and gowns and masks. Turning to the next slide, from the perspective of the federal government, we see nuclear as more than just a technology for generating non-emitting electricity, which it is, uh, but we see it as a strategic asset. And Canada has a pan-Canadian industry from which Canadians and the nation derive significant economic, geopolitical, public health, and environmental benefits. The nuclear sector contributes about 17 billion in GDP and 76,000 jobs across the country. There's over 200 small and medium-sized enterprises. It provides about 15% of Canada's electricity. I already mentioned it produces medical isotopes that are used in cancer treatment and pandemic response. Um, nuclear offsets about 50 million tons of carbon dioxide every year. And it, from a different lens, it has also been a beachhead for international strategic engagement. It's got these geopolitical benefits because by virtue of the fact that we're one of this small elite group of countries, uh, we have a, a seat at international security tables that we otherwise wouldn't have a seat at for a country the size of Canada. Turning to the next slide. So now I'd like to turn to SMRs. And before, any going, before I go any farther, um, and I know we're already about an hour into the program, but I'd like to just stop and pause for a moment and provide a definition of what it is that we're talking about when we talk about SMRs. And so as the name implies, they are smaller. What does that mean? They're smaller both in terms of their physical size and also in terms of their power output. So today in Canada, we have CANDU reactors in Ontario and New Brunswick, and each one of those reactors is a gigawatt scale reactor. So that means each one of those reactors generates on the order of 1,000 megawatts uh, of electricity. And SMR is defined to be anything less than 300 megawatts electric, so less than a third the size of a candy, roughly speaking. Um, but within that category of SMR, from 300 all the way down to two or five megawatts electric, so it's a very big, um, it's a very big category still, and there's different types of SMRs for different applications. And modular. Modular implies that they are meant to be factory produced, manufactured, and the industry is aiming to drive down costs um, by economies of multiples, by standardization, by with advanced manufacturing and modularized manufacturing. So imagine where we're talking about those very small SMRs that are on the order of five megawatts electric and think of uh, the way that we manufacture a pickup truck. And it rolls off a production line and it can be shipped to the site where it is needed. And then it can be, with, um, it can be removed at the end of life cycle. Modular also in the sense that they're scalable. So if you had a uh, technology that was demonstrated and it was five megawatts electric per unit and you were the operator of a mine site that needed, let's say 30 megawatts electric power you might meet the needs of your mine site. And let's imagine that that mine site is currently off grid. And therefore in Canada, if you're off grid right now today, that means you're nearly 100% reliant on diesel, which is costly, it's emitting, and it's also um, polluting from the perspective of local air pollution and noise pollution. And it's logistically complicated. So you're, today you're 100% reliant on diesel. You could phase out your primary diesel by deploying a fleet of six or an array, an array of six of these micro reactors, or if you deployed seven or eight or, or nine of them, you could build in enough redundancy that you might be able to not only phase out your primary diesel, but also your backup diesel. So that's what we mean by small, smaller in terms of size and physical output, smaller in terms or size and power output, modular in terms of manufactured and in terms of uh, scalable, 
uh, and reactor. So at the middle of these devices, there is a nuclear fission reaction. So that's the reaction where we split the atom and it generates heat. Uh, so at the middle of these devices, there is a fission reaction that generates heat. And part of what's interesting here is that many of these generate very high temperature heat. And so that heat can be used directly as industrial uh, process heat. Uh, it can be used for uh, industrial applications like uh, cement, uh, like steel, um, SAG D in the oil sands. It can be used for desalination to generate uh, hydrogen. The heat can obviously also be used for district heating or to, to power or to heat greenhouses in, in the north, which would increase uh, food security. And of course, the heat can always, see, always be used to drive a turbine and generate electricity. Um, so I'm going to turn to the next slide here because uh, this is one of my favorite slides. Uh, this is artwork that was commissioned by uh, an environmental NGO called Third Way. They're based out of Washington, D.C and they hired an artist to do this artwork and we have permission to use the artwork. What I like about this artwork is it gets people thinking about what is going to be new with SMRs. How are they going to be different from today's nuclear that, that, that some people are already familiar with? Uh, and this is just one artist's imagination. So uh, this is just to meant, meant to sort of inspire questions and inspire discussion. What's depicted in the top left-hand corner is a data center. So increasingly, we are all dependent on a digital economy. We run our lives off of these devices and the backbone of these devices are these data centers. They are extremely power hungry. And when they are located in jurisdictions like California that burn coal, they have an enormous footprint on uh, carbon emissions and on climate change. And so what the artist is imagining here is that uh, this SMR is, or sorry, this data center is powered by a combination of SMRs, wind and solar. So when the wind is blowing and the sun is shining, uh, that's where the power is coming from. And when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining, the SMRs kick in and provide power for these data centers in a non-emitting uh, non way. Bottom left-hand corner uh, is probably my least favorite artwork, but it, it makes a really good point, uh, which is industrial applications. So there are enormous parts of the economy, not just in Canada, but around the world, that require high temperature process heat or high quality steam. It is extremely expensive and inefficient to turn electricity back into heat, which is why many parts of the economy that require industrial heat currently use natural gas cogeneration, cogeneration or combined heat and power, because they need that temperature. And there's really no currently available at scale non-emitting alternative to cogen, combined heat and power for heavy industry. SMRs, if proven, are, are potentially the first real viable non-emitting alternative to natural gas cogen. And if that is the case, that could really change very significantly our um, chances of success in deep decarbonization of the economy. Top right-hand corner, we're seeing an SMR uh, depiction here is, SM is an SMR deployed to a remote site where it's providing uh, electricity when the wind isn't blowing. You see wind turbines in the background there. And the heat is being used to heat a greenhouse and provide district heating. And the idea here is that there are other benefits, um, like a greenhouse, uh, where not only are you increasing energy security, but you're also aiming to increase food security in some remote areas. Bottom right-hand corner is probably my favorite. Uh, this is a depiction of an energy park. So here, the idea that the artist is trying to capture is that we need to be thinking about and we need innovation on the integration and the hybridization of a range of technologies. So I think what's depicted here is a combination of geothermal, wind, solar, and SMR. You're seeing it being used. You're also seeing a blue battery with pumped hydro for storage. And uh, you know it's generating electricity. It's probably some desalination going on, and there's some irrigation. And but the idea is the this innovation around the seamless coupling of variable renewables with SMRs, um, and that is an area of work. That energy park concept is an area of work that is being uh, researched at Canadian nuclear laboratories, among other locations. So, uh, turning to our next slide, then. So that's sort of uh, someone's imagination of what this might look like uh, when they are deployed. And it's again, it's meant to get a conversation going. It's not a 
you know, it's not an evidence base. We need, we still need an evidence base. Um, what we have found through our analysis is that there are three distinct markets potentially for SMRs in Canada. And we believe these translate well to the global context as well. So at one, excuse me, at one end of the spectrum, uh, on-grid power generation. And this is one of the key applications that this province of Saskatchewan is investigating. Here, we're talking about SMRs that are at the large end of the spectrum I talked about, sort of that 300 megawatt range. And the main value proposition of these SMRs is to provide electricity, non-emitting electricity on a grid. It turns out that that size is very convenient. It turns out that that's very useful for replacing coal. And there is a legislative mandate, legislation in Canada, that all traditional coal must be taken offline by 2030, which is really creating um, quite an interesting debate and discussion in the province of Saskatchewan around what are the real alternatives to replace those coal power plants. SMRs become one options that can be considered amongst other options, such as natural gas or an intertide import hydro from, uh, from neighboring Manitoba. At the other end of the spectrum, what is depicted here is remote communities. Uh, here, there are in Canada over 200 remote communities that today are nearly 100% reliant on diesel. And I mentioned the challenges of diesel. It's energy insecure because the logistics are complicated. And in fact, the shipping season for diesel is becoming more complicated with the effects of climate change. And it is emitting. Though honestly, uh, there are not that many remote communities. They're very small in terms of their, their output. They are disproportionately feeling the effects of climate change, but they are not themselves the main contributor to climate change. I would say the, the stronger imperative for looking for an alternative to diesel is around the cost of diesel. It's very costly and also around the local air pollution. And then in the middle here, there's this uh, maybe a sweet spot for Canada. Um, heavy industry applications. And again, this is the part that for me as a policymaker, I find very exciting because this is such a hard, such a difficult to abate part of the part of the economy. Our grid in Canada, our electricity grid is already largely decarbonized. It's these other parts of the economy that we really have to figure out what some of our viable non-emitting options are. So this is where the potential market applications are. And these are very different. These are applications in markets and physical locations where conventional uh, nuclear large scale can do's just were never an option uh, because they're too large. Uh, so now with the uh, innovation of these small units, uh, we have the potential, the potential to break into uh, or to, to access and provide alternatives in other parts of the country and in other parts of the economy. Turning to the next slide, please. So I'm now turning to Canada's strategic policy framework for SMRs. Speaking from the perspective of the federal government and thinking back to around 2017, 2018, we could see a wave of innovation developing. There was a lot of growing excitement in the nuclear innovation sector. Physicists at the labs were, were buzzing. You know, there was this, uh, there was this wave of innovation coming, uh, new technologies becoming possible that hadn't been possible before. And in the federal government, we had a lot of questions, though, so big questions, big open-ended questions. Are these things real? When will they be ready? How much are they going to cost? Will they be able to compete on the basis of levelized cost of electricity? What type of waste will they produce? Can we manage that waste safely? How would we regulate these new technologies if they came to, uh, came to reality? Is our legislative and regulatory framework ready and future-proof? And what are the views of Canadians and what are the views of Indigenous people in Canada? Um, is there a market? Is there community confidence? To answer these questions, we convened a pan-Canadian team uh, with provincial and territorial governments and utilities and industry and civil society to oversee analysis by five expert working groups. We convened a series of technical workshops across the country as well as initial engagement sessions with Indigenous people across the country. And at the end of roughly a 10 to 12 month project um, where we aimed to produce the evidence base that would then inform a vision and an approach to SMRs in Canada, we documented what we heard and what we learned in Canada's SMR roadmap, which, is, which situated SMRs within national objectives on environment and climate change, as well as innovation, economy, and jobs. 
Next slide, please. And in 2020, we took the next step. We reconvened a pan-Canadian initiative to develop Canada's SMR action plan, building on the momentum of the roadmap, where the roadmap articulated a vision, that is the what we wanted to achieve. The action plan set out guiding principles, how we want to achieve that. Canadians are principled people, and chief amongst these principles is in partnership and with meaningful benefits sharing with Indigenous people. Where the roadmap set out 53 recommendations for action by a variety of enablers, by governments, by industry, by laboratories, regulator, etc. The action plan responds to all those recommendations with nearly 500 commitments for action that go well beyond the, the original recommendations. In the roadmap, we initiated Indigenous engagement and dialogue. In the action plan, the federal government and other partners have made commitments to meaningful and ongoing engagement. It's not a one and done, one time discussion, it is an ongoing dialogue to build partnerships. 55 organizations contributed to the roadmap in 2018. And on the next slide, we'll see that over 110 partners have joined the action plan. From across Canada, from Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, New Brunswick, PEI, the Yukon, and Nunavut. Those jurisdictions that are interested in SMRs. Some jurisdictions are not interested in SMRs for a variety of reasons. And one of those reasons, I'll just very quickly touch on this, is the economics. So in the SMR roadmap, we did a whole, there's a hundred page economics working group, a summary report, and you're welcome to go, uh, to go take a look at it if you like the quantitative, if you want to see all the assumptions, if you want to make sure we weren't looking at this with rose-colored glasses, it's available online, it's been peer-reviewed, it's gone to several conferences for, um, for debate. And what we found is that we expect SMRs to be competitive on the basis of levelized cost of electricity in some but not all markets. So for example, off-grid where you're trying to replace diesel, you could expect to see a 20 to 60% cost savings compared to diesel. SMRs are not expected to be competitive with large hydro in the jurisdiction of Quebec, for example, uh, which is probably why you see uh, Quebec has not joined the action plan. But SMRs are expected to be competitive with natural gas, even with a moderate price on carbon in jurisdictions like Saskatchewan. And I have to tell you that that was a bit of a surprising uh, finding. We expected that the, the price on carbon would have to be very high before SMRs would be com competitive with natural gas. And that was not the finding of the analysis. So anyway, so I say from jurisdictions across Canada, uh, some but not all, including federal, provincial, territorial, municipal governments, indigenous partners, industry and civil society. And all of Canada's SMR Action Plan partners endorsed the vision, committed to the principles, and are taking action to turn our roadmap and vision into reality. Turning to the next slide, this is a vision that situates SMRs within broader national priorities on climate change, innovation, and good jobs. And we invite you to check out Canada's SMR Action Plan at smractionplan.ca. There you can see all of the voluntary actions, commitments that are, have been made by all of the partners. It is a report out to Canadians and to the citizenry. It is an introduction and it is a way of staying abreast of the development of, of SMRs in Canada. And this is our plan for the development, the demonstration, and the deployment of SMRs in Canada to produce SMRs that can be considered as an option um, to replace emitting sources of energy to provide a source of safe, clean, affordable energy, opening opportunities for a resilient, low carbon future and capturing benefits for Canada and Canadians. I'm happy to take, uh, to take questions when we, look, when we turn to that part of the discussion, but I, I thank you for your attention and uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Deanne, for raising such interesting issues as deep decarbonization, offering a detailed explanation of SMRs, industrial heat requirements and industry alternatives to natural gas and cogen and picking up on Dr. Walker's way forward and Canada's SMR advantage. Lastly, I would like to ask Dr. Bragg Sitton to offer some commentary on small nuclear in the context of global and American uh, issues, as well as talking about distributed generation. Over to Dr. Bragg Sitton. 
Thank you so much and uh, good evening to everyone and thank you for the opportunity to join you today, my neighbors to the north, to talk a little bit about uh, the perspectives on the role of nuclear energy uh, in order to achieve this clean energy economy and the role of some of these innovations uh, that Bob and Deanne have discussed and given such an excellent overview of. I feel like I'm really just going to put a, an exclamation point on some of those points. And I am going to keep this fairly high level, recognizing that we have a very diverse audience here, which is fantastic. And I'm happy to dive into deeper technical discussions uh, with anyone if, if you'd like to contact me later. Let me just start by noting that we cannot predetermine a solution for our energy systems before we truly understand and agree upon the goals that we're trying to achieve within a particular region or community or more broadly when we think about global perspectives associated with selecting energy technologies. Some of these goals that we've talked about are very important such as energy reliability, affordability, availability, and grid resilience, and of course environmental impact, minimal environmental impact we also need to understand all of the energy demands that might be served by these energy resources. So these could be electrical in nature, but if they're purely electrical in nature, they would lead to a very different solution set than if we begin to look more holistically about uh, with regard to the demands for both heat and electricity that have been discussed by the previous speakers. Only then when we fully understand these aspects, can we really begin to assess the best generation mix to meet the demands in a particular region for a particular purpose? Again, I feel like a lot of this has already been stated, but it is very important to understand uh, the situation we're currently in. If we look globally across the developed world, nuclear energy provides a significant fraction of non-emitting electricity. In the US, uh, nuclear energy provides just under 20% of our electricity, but that equates to 55% of our non-emitting electricity. If we limit the role of nuclear energy only to electricity production and meeting electrical demand, then we significantly limit our options to meet the global goals that we have set out to reduce emissions from both the energy generation and the use sectors. If we look at it more carefully, we realize that industry and transportation are much more difficult to abate than the electricity sector, but they collectively contribute about two thirds of the emissions in developed countries. So as has been mentioned in 2015, the Paris Agreement established a goal to limit global temperature rise to less than two degrees Celsius. This is a very aggressive goal that does require immediate and aggressive action if we're to be successful. And it requires many countries to work toward that goal together. The global reality is that energy use is increasing around the world. And you see this estimate of 28% growth by 2040 with much of that in, de excuse me, in developing nations. And if we continue to emit greenhouse gases at the same rates that we currently do, we really have no hope of meeting those goals. However, it's really exciting to see that more and more companies, states, uh, federal entities are setting goals that are technology inclusive. What that means is that instead of seeing renewable portfolio standards, we are beginning to see more technology inclusive clean energy standards that allows us to consider more of what's in our energy toolbox to meet these growing energy demands. Now these examples and these percentages uh, reflected on the slide correspond to US clean energy standards, but we see these trends globally as well. Additionally, as uh, my the previous speakers uh, mentioned, there are, are a number of recent studies that have been conducted, not by nuclear organizations, but by broader organizations, such as the International Energy Agency, academia, national laboratories and nonprofit organizations that have looked at a variety of low or zero carbon technologies that can be used in a number of different combinations in order to meet growing energy demands. But these studies conclude that although there are many options available, the contribution from new, without contribution from nuclear energy, those costs associated with achieving deep decarbonization increases dramatically. And Deanne had a, an excellent figure there, I think it was 1.6 trillion 
uh, as the cost difference if we don't include nuclear in that solution set. So these are very important discussions that we're having across our countries. And I want to point out uh, how our grid today operates and how we tend to look at our, in, our in energy resources. Today's grid does primarily focus on independent generators that work with independent system operators that manage the grid to ensure that the demand is met so that the lights come on when we need it. Industrial energy demands are then typically met by independent thermal generators. And these are primarily fossil generators as was mentioned by the previous speaker. This independent operation of all of these resources leads to inefficiencies in how we use the invested capital in putting these resources on the grid or installing these resources to support industry. And as more and more renewable generators are added to the grid, this is necessary. It's a component that we need to include when we look to reduce emissions holistically. But as we see those increasing, we do see increased variability in the grid that must be accommodated either through additional energy storage, which has limitations, and that can be a separate discussion of those limitations, or it means curtailment of traditionally baseload assets such as nuclear energy generators. So that means turning down the power from these assets and not use, utilizing them to the extent that they were intended, which reduces revenues, which drives some of those uh, plants to no longer be economically viable. So instead, when we look to how to support growing energy demands, we need to look at both the benefits and the shortcomings of all of these generation options as we assess the potential solutions uh, that we have available to us. And each of these resources does have a role. As we look to providing clean energy to meet demands across the electricity, industrial, as well as transportation sectors. Today, transportation mostly relies on fossil fuels and we see more and more electrification, but there is also a role for hydrogen fuel cell vehicles that could be supported by nuclear energy. The most prominent efforts to decarbonize, if we look globally, they tend to focus on the electric sector and they look to opportunities uh, for this electrification. However, not all processes can or should be electrified. Making significant progress towards emissions reduction really must entail increased utilization of non-emitting thermal resources beyond the electricity sector, as we depict here in this generalized slide. When heat is converted to electricity, we lose about 60% of that energy uh, just due to inefficiencies in the conversion process. And we can better utilize that heat as primary high temperature, high quality heat from a nuclear plant, for example, or we can even use the rejected lower temperature heat to support other uh, processes or district heating that require lower temperatures. INL, uh, my laboratory, in collaboration with a number of uh, other US national laboratories, and, and yes, Canadian Nuclear Laboratories is working in some of this area as well, uh, we're looking to these alternate solutions that improve coordination among our energy generation technologies, either through increased interaction uh, via the grid, so enhanced uh, communication across these generators and serving the grid demand, or via tightly coupled energy parks that manage these interconnected resources such as nuclear, wind, solar, and fossil with carbon capture and sequestration to meet a suite of energy demands, whether that be electrical, industrial applications, hydrogen production, water purification, et cetera. And by managing these behind that grid interconnect, we can more efficiently utilize the energy resources we have available. Our analyses indicate that we can enhance operational efficiencies as well as energy affordability by allowing renewables to generate electricity when they are available, but then directing that primary heat from other clean generation technologies when we don't need it to meet grid demand to support these industrial demands or to produce process intermediates such as hydrogen that can supply an array of consumer products, which could include synthetic transportation fuels that can support heavy duty ground transport or aviation, basically applications that we really shouldn't uh, electrify or don't make much sense to electrify. 
So this operational paradigm can provide a more efficient utilization of the capital that we invest to build these plants, while also reducing emissions from these harder to abate sectors such as industry and transportation. Dynamically supporting these multiple and varied energy demands does provide an additional revenue source to the nuclear plants that otherwise might be operating up and down in their power to accommodate variable demand, which then further supports their long-term economic viability. And with the advent of small modular reactors and micro reactors on that few, scale of a few megawatts, these options become viable even for more remote regions and islanded microgrids that may be necessary to support some communities, mining activities, et cetera. We can enhance the uh, coordination of these resources in a number of ways. And nuclear energy does offer a range of flexibility options that allow it to be complementary to dispatch, a complementary dispatchable energy resource that can work alongside variable renewables. So this first image on the left represents operational flexibility. And this is in a sense the status quo when we have nuclear plants operating in a renewable heavy grid and nuclear energy, or even a, a grid that has significant amounts of base load, we see those plants operating up and down in power to accommodate the variable net demand from the grid. This has a long operational experience and many countries do this, but it isn't economically efficient at all times. Instead, we want to look more toward this product flexibility that I've mentioned on the previous slide, where we can then begin to assess the role of a nuclear plant to provide a number of, to provide what is needed by a number of different applications. Rather than producing electricity 24 seven, this energy can then be directed to provide heating or be stored for later use or to support the production of these other commodities uh, that we use every day. Moving away from the reliance of those processes on the traditional fossil resources. Uh, we can even use this energy uh, to convert fossil feed stocks to higher value consumer, consumer products. So instead of burning coal to produce heat and electricity, use that coal as a carbon-based resource to produce products that have higher value. And finally, really the focus of much of what we're talking about uh, this evening is the deployment flexibility that is offered by uh, so many of these newer plant designs that allow for the system to be right sized to the energy needs of any community or industrial process. These smaller scale plants, such as small modular reactors or these micro reactors that have been mentioned, uh, really can be on the scale of distributed renewable installations such that we can then introduce these new operational paradigms that will help ensure reliable energy supply and a complementary suite of generation options to meet the various energy demands. So as you heard from Dr. Walker and Ms. Cameron, these advanced systems are being developed by more than 70 different companies uh, globally, many of them uh, in the US and Canada, and they will be ready for deployment in the very near term. In the US, we recently stood up the National Reactor Innovation Center, and they're tasked with demonstrating two advanced reactor technologies by 2025, so just a few years down the road, and two more by 2030, such that these systems really will be available. Uh, we recognize renewables are very quick to build, uh, but many of these plants introducing the modularity and the factory fabrication and assembly of these smaller plants allows us to introduce nuclear technology also in a much more rapid time frame and at reduced costs relative to the large scale reactors that we've traditionally operated. This also limits uh, what's necessary for site preparation. So these newer uh, system designs, smaller system designs really are changing the paradigm for nuclear and how it will operate alongside these renewable systems. I also want to highlight just a bit more about the clean energy ministerial effort that uh, Dr. Walker mentioned earlier. Uh, the US and Canada aren't alone in looking at these innovative nuclear energy options and the role of nuclear energy alongside renewables as a part of meeting that goal for net zero carbon emissions. As was mentioned in 2018, uh, the US, Canada and Japan launched this Nuclear Innovation Clean Energy Future initiative within the Clean Energy Ministerial 
This was the first time that nuclear energy was officially brought to the ministerial table for discussion as a clean energy solution, even though it had been providing clean electricity for, for many years. Uh, the initiative has since been joined by eight additional participant countries and a number of external partners, all of whom are working together to explore these innovative applications for nuclear energy, to evaluate integrated and coordinated energy systems that I've mentioned, and to pool our experience on system economics and financing of these systems, and to engage policymakers and stakeholders such as yourselves as a part of the discussion in how we might address future energy demands and meeting those demands with a number of options. So I just want to end by, by saying that I do look forward to the US working with Canada to support deployment of these emerging energy options uh, that really will help us to better meet our current and future energy demands. I was uh, amused to see that uh, Deanne used the same images. I also am inspired by these images and uh, helped to work with Third Way to produce these architectural concepts of what we really mean when we talk about small modular reactors and nuclear energy in a context that we don't traditionally think of it for nuclear. So there are so many opportunities that we can bring to the table that will provide energy security and decarbonization. And I really look forward to the discussion and to hearing your comments on these. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Thank you, Shannon, for those insightful global American remarks and the technical information surrounding designing future energy systems. And thank you, Robert and Deanne, for sharing with us your thoughts on how SMRs could provide Saskatchewan with reliable power. You've given us so much uh, to think about uh, in challenges and opportunities. So a reminder to our audience members, if you have a question for our panelists, please submit it to me via Zoom's chat function. I've been following the chat and there's been a very rich discussion uh, with a lot of questions asked, a lot of questions answered. So please uh, give me a direct email message if you still have an outstanding question. I'm gonna take advantage of my role as moderator and ask a couple questions and then take a couple from the floor. We're already running over time. So I suggest that we run for perhaps another 15 minutes uh, and then we'll close the discussion down. So my first question, I'm going to take the advantage from Sean Tucker who's asked a very apropos question which Shannon has answered a bit. Um, and I'll put it to some of our Canadian panelists about when realistically will Canada have an SMR deployed? How far along are we? And when can we actually see some results? I'd, ha I'd be happy to have a go at that here, Argo. I, I mean, the, so there's deployment and there's demonstration. Uh, you could argue a demonstration is a deployment, but currently we have uh, a commitment for a micro SMR to be demonstrated at CNL in the next few years. That's been financed, the agreement has been established, and the actual design is now going through regulatory approval. Uh, an enormously important commitment by Ontario Power Generation to uh, deploy at least one SMR by 2028 at its Darlington site. That will be on grid. So, and, and there's a, a, a three, vendor technologies that are being considered in that mix and they're open to others being considered. Uh, there are a, a view of having two reactors deployed at the LaPro site in the early 2030s. Uh, I would highlight that this is not all about Canada. Canada, as, as both Diane and I have highlighted, has this interesting mix of, of a regulatory process that in, and, uh, you know, allows innovation, that we've got these markets and that we have a tier one nation. The question here is, are we going to seize the opportunity in Canada? Because those 70 odd country, uh, companies out there are also working. There are SMRs currently deployed in Russia, and there are SMRs uh, deployed in the um, in Middle East by South Korea, and there are more coming. So the point here is that this is not just about uh, Canada. Uh, that said, I would like to think that the combination of Canada potentially partnering with uh, the U.S. could be a, a global leader with our act together on how to move forward. A number of comments I see as threads here in the notion of 
uh, yes, clean up Canada, and we haven't made uh, an iota of difference in GHGs globally. Uh, and just as we led with CANDU technology and now uh, have our technology is now 10% of the global fleet, there is an opportunity for Canadian technology in the SMR space to make a difference uh, globally. Uh, it's the opportunities there. Let's see that Diane's talked a bit about this with, you know, the, the market in, in is not really around northern communities. The market is the many communities around the world where our experience could then be leveraged to show others how to do it. Hope that's helpful. That's great. Diane? Um, yes, so the, there are there are so many opportunities for uh, for international collaboration here. Um, uh, Shannon mentioned uh, a few key multilateral collaborations that we've already started, uh, including under the Clean Energy Ministerial Framework. Uh, so the Clean Energy Ministerial is a spin-off, if you will, or a um, uh, it, it is a. It, it came from the COP negotiations on climate change. That's where the the original concept came from. Uh, countries go to COP to negotiate targets and make commitments to uh, emissions reductions. SEM, by comparison, so COP is this negotiating space. SEM, by comparison, is a is a coalition of willing countries that are seeking to collaborate on solutions to help us meet our uh, commitments that we've made under COP. So they're complementary for uh, Canada uh, stepped onto the world stage uh, when we hosted SEM 10. So the 10th ministerial meeting of the clean energy uh, ministerial framework in Vancouver in 2019. And uh, we took uh, great effort and great steps to um, mainstream uh, the discussion of nuclear uh, into the higher level and the, the cross-cutting discussions about clean energy broadly. Uh, prior to Canada's hosting of the Clean Energy Ministerial in 2019, many of the discussions at the international level on clean energy and climate change had been silent on the question of the role of nuclear. Um, and so with, with the, the launch of the NICE Future Initiative, which is the Nuclear Innovation Clean Energy Future Initiative that Canada and the US and Japan co-lead, uh, and we, we, we managed to, to bring that science uh, basis and that evidence base to those policy tables where uh, policymakers at the highest level were talking about how do we get to our targets? What are our actual options that are available at the scale that we need them on the timelines that we need them? Uh, and it's, for me, it's, it's less about are you pro or anti-nuclear? It's about um, uh, bringing the evidence base to the discussion to ensure the rigor of the policy debate, to ensure that it is, because we, you know, reasonable people can differ in their priorities and can differ in their conclusions, but we should establish uh, the fact base, we should establish the science and the, the evidence base um, first, and then we can discuss what to do about it. Uh, and and so, so that's one really important initiative and, and not coincidentally, not coincidentally, that is where the IEA, that is the venue where the IEA chose to release its first report on nuclear energy in, in 20 years. So that's one important policy dialogue. We work very, very closely uh, with Canada US uh, collaborations uh, ranging from s and to policy dialogues. We work very closely with the UK. Uh, in 2020, we launched uh, a Canada-UK action plan on SMRs. Uh, we had a delegation of about 50 Canadian organizations that traveled to London and the UK um, to explore our complementary capabilities within the supply chain, in the laboratories, at the regulatory level, uh, and policy dialogues. So um, there is probably no country that can do this alone. Um, uh, and, and international collaboration is going to be key. So for Canada, some top priorities there are uh, bringing that evidence base to the policy debates about climate change and working with uh, friendly and like-minded partners uh, to make sure that we position uh, safe and secure Western solutions as options to meet, uh, to meet the market demand. Uh, we need to position Western collaborations to compete with state-owned enterprises from elsewhere in the world. 
I, I, that's what I would say about international collaboration and, and uh, its role in, in sort of realizing the SMR vision. Thank you, Ian. Uh, and Dr. Bragg Sitton, I really loved your presentation and it was I was struck with the question of you really linked industry and SMRs and, and the applications together, but very often industry, power production, electric vehicles, they're all in silos. So how is it through policy or is it through education that we that we bring and link everything together in such a beautiful fashion that you were describing? I think there's a number of aspects to it, and it, I would probably say all of the above, but it has to st really start with communication. So we have been working for a number of years to reach to industry to let them know that nuclear is not just the gigawatt scale reactor on the hill outside of town, but there are so many other forms and fashions that this resource can come into uh, supporting their demands. And so we've started lines of communication and I'm happy to say we're starting to get that industry pull. They're beginning to look to nuclear as an opportunity to meet their carbon emission goals. If I go back to those clean energy standards, we see so many utilities, independent companies, as well as municipalities and US states making these goals, setting these goals for clean energy for 2030, 2040, 2050. And they're beginning to recognize that in order to do that reliably and at reasonable cost, they have to broaden their perspectives on what types of resources can come to the table. So number one is education and just getting the information out to a very broad set of individuals, getting out of our silos and talking to people in uncomfortable conversations sometimes to not only share what the technology can do, but to listen to the requirements of these different industrial processes and listen to the concerns. So you aren't considering nuclear, why? Can I help you, can I help understand the concern or the challenge? And it may or may not be a fit, but until we open that dialogue, we won't know. Now policy may end up being a part of that. I hate to force things with policy. Uh, so I don't want that to be the first solution uh, because as I said, we need to all understand the assets that we have as well as the energy demands that we need to meet. And I'll also note uh, in the US, uh, you mentioned in my introduction, this Applied Energy Tri-Laboratory Consortium. This was an effort that came together both at the grassroots among the researchers at the laboratories, as well as uh, from the top down by our leadership in the Department of Energy that said, you all need to look at your areas of expertise and to better understand how these resources can work together to meet future energy demands. Come back to us with a solution that leverages all of our areas of expertise. And so that's what we're doing. And we're learning to communicate and understand one another's uh, concerns and understand the resources that may be available to us. Great, thank you. So maybe we'll take a few questions from the floor. On the chat, there was some questions centering around uh, fuel. So if Peter Otzen, Otzensmeyer, sorry on your last name, if you're still there and would like to ask your question, you could unmute. Thanks, it was to uh, Bob Walker. Uh, basically, as a tier one uh, nation, uh, I think we should have fuel cycling. We don't, but the SMR uh, approach really gives us an opportunity to, to get into that. What will it take uh, really to establish this in Canada? Thank you. Thank you, Peter, and great to connect with you. I know you've been a, a strong proponent for advanced reactor designs and the uh, unlocking the potential of used can do fuels to, uh, to keep it all going. These are enormously important big ideas. Uh, as I try to highlight in that chart I used or what an SMR um, system looks like, uh, I think it gets to the heart of the question and the challenge we have is that we tend to focus on the, the end issue, which is a reactor but realizing that there's actually a system behind it. And we need to make the smart decisions as to where those elements will be located. 
factories to construct. Uh, uh, obviously, the DGR will be our own, the Deep Geologic Repository. And you raise a quit critical question of what's the role we're going to play in the fuel cycle, uh, which, of course, is highly connected to the choice of technology you have for the reactor. Uh, I think this is an enormously rich issue for exploring. Where I suggest the, um, the question would emerge is whether that fuel is for Canada or for the world. And if it's for the world, the waste streams that will come out of fuel repos repos reprocessing are those Canada's wastes now or the world's wastes. And I think that's a, a kind of a, a delicate question. The engineer in me says, well, that shouldn't really matter. But there is a perception issue uh, around this notion that we're going to end up with uh, waste that somebody else is actually um, uh, retaining. Uh, sorry, I just had another call coming in on my <laughs> phone. Peter, is that, uh, did I get, did you want to have a follow up on that? Uh, well, I think we have to start somewhere. And I think Canada is uh, small enough that we can actually do it. Uh, you know, if we think about the world, it's going to be overwhelming. Well, okay. I, I think these are all valid comments here. And I think the perspective needs to be on the SMR system. So if I could use that, fuel reprocessing is a critical element of it. Equally important is where is the, the uh, manufacturing capabilities going to be as well. So you're raising an enormously important point that we need to think about. Thank you. And I have another question from Will Ingenthron. Will, would you like to unmute? Hi there. Uh, yeah, thanks for your time and thanks for taking the question. I kind of uh, had a bit of uh, an answer here uh, that Diane has uh, um, alluded to in the comments. I appreciate it. But my question is, and this is something that has kind of been difficult to, to dig up anywhere, but I'm really keen on understanding the levelized cost of energy of an SMR in Saskatchewan. Um, I guess uh, just to preface that a little bit, I'm a little bit concerned of the, uh, the push of developing SMRs in the region. I'm not against SMRs. Um, I'm just for the economic development of power generation in the region. Um, and uh, when there's little to or negligible development of other resources such as solar when we live in a region that has um, better solar, a better solar resource and a heck of a lot more land than a place like Florida and uh, the levelized cost of where solar is being procured in the prairies currently uh, or even two years ago for about under $50 uh, a megawatt hour. Um, so that's two years ago pricing. Uh, but anyways, uh, I'll leave it to you guys uh, to try and shed some light on that uh, for myself. Thanks so much. So I, I think there's a few things that I would say in response to that, Will. It's, um, it, it, is very, like, it is very difficult to do the modeling because it's very dependent on uh, the different scenarios. And there's, you, can, you can paint a picture of many, many different scenarios. It depends on... Uh, the natural endowments in that jurisdiction, is there hydro, uh, what is the wind potential, what is the solar potential, uh, what are the grid capabilities, uh, it depends on the cost of capital. Uh, you'll see if you, I, we've been chatting in the, in the chat window and, and when you dig into the economics analysis, you'll see that SMR um, levelized cost of electricity estimates are very sensitive to uh, cost of capital. So there are markets where they're very competitive if, uh, if you apply a 6% discount rate, but they're not competitive if you apply a 9% discount rate. So uh, the, that's the first thing that I would mention. Um, the, the second thing that I would mention is uh, the IEA report. Um, so it, it, that IEA report that found that the cost of meeting uh, the two degree scenario without nuclear would be on a global scale, 1.6 US trillion dollars more. And um, that doesn't give you the levelized cost of electricity, but it does tell you something about the overall costs. And, uh, and one of the challenges with nuclear projects is that they're capital, uh, capital intensive. So upfront capital costs uh, are, uh, you know, can be a, uh, a challenge uh, to, to overcome. But when you look at uh, life cycle uh, costs, 
uh, then you start comparing apples to apples uh, and you start to see uh, a, a, a more favorable comparison. And, and that comparison of apples to apples, that's really important to make sure we're not comparing apples to oranges. So when people cite the levelized cost of electricity from wind and solar, you have to be careful to ask if they're citing the spot price of electricity or if they have factored in the system costs that are, that are necessary to support the variability that is introduced by variable renewables onto the grid. And so it is actually quite, quite complex. So I, I would welcome, uh, I mean, if, you, if you'd like to dig into the economics analysis, I may not personally be able to answer all of your questions, but I can certainly connect you to the economists who did the analysis. We, we pushed them very hard to try to take conservative estimates and to try to do that sensitivity analysis and really paint um, a, a, a thorough picture of where will they be competitive and where will they not be competitive. That, that's great, Diana, I appreciate that. Um, it's, oh, we're, we're really lucky to have the opportunity yeah. to uh, uh, have Alberta as an open power market um, that uh, removes the transmission and distribution charges uh, and splits out the raw cost of power. And I do understand and respect that the interconnection distribution transmission chargers, all the rate riders uh, are all a part of the equation, but we do have that data and information there and an open uh, power market that's been uh, deregulated since 2001. Um, I am happy to help with some of this analysis actually, because I have spent uh, a large portion of my career um, developing power plants, specifically solar and wind in these uh, locations. And we have to take into consideration transmission distribution charges and uh, part of the energy market oh, I, uh, and, and the levelized cost of energy and, and how it influences. And every region is different for sure. Um, but it's if we are talking about SMR specifically in Saskatchewan, um, it kind of pains me in my home region province to see the, uh, the the potential for public money being spent similarly to other blips that have happened in the past uh, when we are not doing any sort of development for other types of generation that could really benefit um, the the region. Uh, and I'm, I'm not again, I'm not against SMRs. I just am really keen on making sure that the people of the province don't get kind of hoodwinked. Um, but that's my personal opinion of it there. Thank you so much. Thanks for that. Diane? Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, there's two, two, th two more things that I'd like to say. Uh, first about uh, public funds, and then second about uh, the uh, Saskatchewan uh, scenario. So first on the spending of public funds, what I can uh, uh, point you to quite clearly is that the federal government has invested billions and billions of dollars actually in uh, solar and wind projects across the country. So uh, the most recent announcement of the strengthened climate plan includes $15 billion uh, and the vast majority of that is for renewables projects. And so it, to, to suggest that somehow the federal government is spending disproportionately more on SMR development than wind and solar is simply factually not true. And um, that's the first point. Uh, the, the second point, it, but, but related to that is, is the second point, which is that it really is not an either or scenario. It's not SMRs at the expense of wind or solar, and it's not wind and solar at the expense of SMRs. Uh, depending on where you are in the country, uh, you probably need both. Uh, and certainly the conclusion of uh, many analysts is that we need all non-emitting options and we need as much of all the non-emitting options as we can possibly deploy and we need to do it fast. So my understanding from, uh, from discussions with, uh, with the province of Saskatchewan uh, at the level of the provincial government and also at the level of the power utility, Sask Power, is that there's roughly four gigawatts I'm speaking in, in like round numbers. There's roughly four gigawatts of power of fossil generation that the province needs to phase out uh, to get to net zero. Uh, and uh, Saskatchewan has world-class wind and solar potential in the south of the province. And uh, taking a renewables first approach, uh, the utility expects that they can probably uh, deploy about one gigawatt of wind and solar and they can manage that on the grid. Uh, you are neighboring to Manitoba. And so there is also the opportunity to, uh, to, to explore an intertie to import hydro from Manitoba. 
the economics of that become tricky when you think about exporting the jobs from Saskatchewan to Manitoba. And so I, the, the provincial government sort of just again in very rough numbers estimates that they can import about one gigawatt of hydro from neighboring Manitoba before it becomes a significant negative impact on jobs in Saskatchewan, which leaves you with a two megawatt, uh, two gigawatt, excuse me, two gigawatt gap. And there you are down to very few options and those residual options are really natural gas or SMRs. And if you deploy natural gas to, to fill that last two gigawatt gap, you will have just deployed the last emitting resource on the grid in Saskatchewan. And the next opportunity to further decarbonize will be when those assets age off of the grid in 20 some odd years. So it is in that context that SMRs are being contemplated. And in fact, in, in many jurisdictions, SMRs um, complement, uh, they don't compete with, uh, with uh, variable renewables. In fact, in many jurisdictions from a purely economics perspective, they compete with hydro. They don't as baseload to backstop variable renewables. They really are not competing with wind and solar. So I, I'll, but I'll just leave it there. Thanks, Ian. So the last question goes to Graham. Hey, uh, Bob had brought this up. I thought it was quite important and I was just curious if you wanted to elaborate or if anyone else had um, a point on it. Has there been any talks with indig indigenous uh, communities? And if so, what is their perspective on uh, the whole like SMRs and, and depositories? I, I'm not sure that was that question for me, Graham, or for anybody or yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, let me let me just say that, uh, and I'm sure Deanne will come into this. There's uh, many many layers to that. I, I would highlight that the, the, the deepest uh, engagement that's been going on for some years now is around the siting of that national deep geological repository I made reference to, which um, ha has two big themes to it. One is find a site with the right geology. To my point, that you want to be able to put. Uh, these materials in geological structures that will be uh, stable and secure for millennia. Uh, again, learning for what nature does. And the second is to cite it in a community uh, with, uh, with indigenous uh, nations around it that, that are willing to cite it. And that, so that's called adaptive phase management. And the concept is find that sweet spot where you've got the geology right, and where you've got uh, a host community, and importantly, where you've also consulted with communities that would be affected or would be in the transportation paths of moving, uh, uh, you know, this is about high level waste, moving the used fuel from our Canada reactor sites to the actual facility. That engagement has been going on for, uh, Diane, I guess it's 15 years. Uh, there's been a number of uh, sites uh, explored along the way. We are down to two and uh, with this, where the geology is working and there seems to be a community slash indigenous community uh, interest that is yet to be confirmed, but that's the journey underway. When it comes to uh, a great, in the SMR roadmap, perhaps Diane could speak to that, but I know that there's a number of uh, Indigenous, indigenous peoples that have stepped forward and say, we'd like to be engaged and, and a number who said we're not. So Diane, perhaps you could fill in the blanks there. Uh, sure, and this is such an important question and it, it's important for SMRs and the nuclear sector, uh, but it's important uh, for all natural resource projects and all infrastructure projects in Canada. And we've, we've come to a point, I think, as a nation where we now uh, understand, reflecting on many mistakes that have been made uh, in the history of the nation, we now understand uh, that uh, partnership and meaningful benefits sharing are um, essential for successful natural resource projects. Um, and that, that requires us to act and to engage long before the the legal duty to consult, the constitutional duty to consult uh, uh, clause is triggered. So in, as a pri for those who are, are not aware, in the Canadian constitution, uh, if you are going to uh, build a project, 
uh, of any type, uh, but let's say an SMR, uh, that has the potential to adversely affect the rights of Indigenous people in Canada, um, then there is a constitutional duty to consult uh, Indigenous, those Indigenous community, communities. And, uh, and there's lots of jurisprudence on what it means to consult and does it mean consult and accommodate and what does it mean to accommodate and what, are, what is a fair uh, benefits share, approach to benefits sharing. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of lessons that have been learned and what we've heard um, consistently is that uh, the best practice, the most respectful practice, the, the, the approach that will allow us to walk the path of reconciliation is to engage early and often. Um, at, you know, we're taking steps at, at the federal level to uh, implement legislation on the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, to um, uh, uh, to uh, operationalize free and prior the clauses around free and free prior informed consent. It's getting late here in Ottawa. <laughs> um, so, against that backdrop. Uh, I will say that we have uh, begun outreach and initiated dialogues with a variety of Indigenous uh, groups and organizations and communities, a mix of uh, representatives of rights holders and engagement practitioners um, across the nation. Uh, we've actually uh, engaged via letters with over 100 uh, communities in Canada. Uh, we have had Zoom conversations with over 75 communities in Canada, uh, and we're beginning these conversations. Um, they are very early stages, and this is not something that where you have one Zoom call and then you're done. This, these are long-term investments uh, to build these relationships. Um, so th there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, what we're hearing from Indigenous people, and you can't paint with a single brush, is that uh, some groups are open uh, to SMRs and see the value. And, and in fact, there are uh, Indigenous communities that want to become equity investors and want to be partners at the ground level on, on SMR projects. And then there are other communities where it's not right for them and, and they're not interested. So it, it really is a diverse landscape. Um, but it, it is, um, it is, in my view, one of the most important um, uh, things that we need to work on if we want to bring SMRs to reality and make them a reasonable and viable option, um, the technology risks are manageable. Um, it's, it's the people uh, issues that, uh, that we need to focus on the most. Thank you for that. And to wind up, I'm going to ask the panelists to respond in reverse order of presentations, 30 sec seconds. We've had a really rich chat and there have been some reservations raised. So what's a, what should Saskatchewan do in 30 seconds uh, in the future surrounding these reservations? Shannon. So uh, Saskatchewan is a clearly not uh, where I am at. However, I think that what uh, we see Canada choose to do and how you select future energy sources will be very impactful, just like uh, choices that we make in the US will be impactful to other regions as well. I encourage a thoughtful look at all energy resources available. Uh, I encourage a thoughtful look at system costs, not just levelized cost of energy for a particular asset, but system costs and impacts of that, because that does come into play. I do believe that small nuclear has a very significant role in Canada and Saskatchewan and in other regions as well. And I think it will be a very nice complement to renewables. So I hope to, to follow this conversation. I hope to see some of those decisions being made. And I hope that uh, the US can partner with Canada on some of these projects and deployments so that we can learn from one another and accelerate the process in both of our countries. Thanks, Shannon. Deanne. Uh, so I've been very impressed so far by how Saskatchewan has proceeded uh, with this. Uh, there is a public facing dialogue that is now uh, seeking to, you know, at the level of the premier and uh, the mayor of Estevan and, and others sort of at the political level, really bringing this to the public. You're seeing more and more uh, articles in newspapers and the like on the topic. I think, and events like this one, I think are, are absolutely essential. It, it, so what I would say Saskatchewan needs to do is continue what you're doing, uh, bring the conversation, bring SMR 101, 
uh, bring the evidence base, but also listen, uh, listen uh, to people. And I think that, uh, you know, nuclear is one of those issues that um, uh, uh, the emotions run high sometimes in discussions about nuclear. And I think uh, the right thing to do, uh, and this is not just in Saskatchewan, but you asked about Saskatchewan, is to have a conversation where we listen to each other. Uh, we can see the results on public policy and on governance when we allow uh, discussions to become polarized and people stop listening to each other and they stop talking to each other. And we don't want that to happen uh, in Canada. We don't want that to happen in Saskatchewan. So let's keep the conversation going. Thank you so much. And Robert. Just get off mute here. Uh, I made the remark uh, in the introduction of my presentation, the importance of conversations. Uh, you know, three of us have talked. The chat is a conversation. And I, uh, what a rich, uh, rich set of, of questions and, and comments and observations. And I say it's a rich uh, source of information to perhaps mine. And maybe I say it to you, Margo and team is considering how you might say, I mean, people may want to see it uh, anonymous, but I think there's opportunity to mine that to see the kind of themes that are emerging that people are, are raising. And I do see it, it, a large part of it is around, let's be clear on the economics, uh, that interplay between uh, you know, renewables and nuclear is, a, is certainly a, a key part of it. And uh, you know, is, is uh, SMR real? What's it gonna cost? So that's one set of equations. There's a, another set of uh, comments here about uh, indigenous relationships and how that's gonna play out. Um, and, and perhaps there's another question on the uh, opportunity that we may have for what happens in Saskatchewan and Canada to uh, go, go, go global. So, you know, I, my sense is that we did some work around the key themes emerging as perhaps a platform for a, a further session. Uh, that might be a, an interesting idea to, uh, to uh, pursue. And a, a big thank you for those who have taken the time to join us and add your comments to the chat. Great, thank you. So thank you, Robert, Shannon, and Deanne for your thoughtful presentations. I think what stood out for most for me at tonight's presentation was how Canada, its partners, importantly, the United States, thanks to Shannon, is engaged on addressing climate change and SMRs are a key part of this strategy. And although Saskatchewan has a deep experience with uranium mining, I've learned so much from our speakers about our other Canadian provinces, the United States and states in respect of nuclear energy. So thank you again to our speakers and let's keep the conversation going. On behalf of Johnson Tram, a graduate school in the Center for the Study of Science and Innovation Policy, I would like to thank our speakers and you, our audience, for joining us this evening. For more information on upcoming JSGS lectures or to learn more about our programs, visit us online at www School of Public Policy. Thank you to all of you. Thank you so much and have a great night.